The Bride Comes to Yellow Sky by Stephen Crane Read by Douglas Hambly Part 1 The great Pullman was whirling onward with such dignity of motion that a glance from the window seemed simply to prove that the plains of Texas were pouring eastward. Vast flats of green grass, dull-hued spaces of mesquite and cactus, little groups of frame houses, woods of light and tender trees, all were sweeping into the east, sweeping over the horizon, a precipice. A newly married pair had boarded this coach at San Antonio. The man's face was reddened from many days in the wind and sun, and a direct result of his new black clothes was that his brick-colored hands were constantly performing in a most conscious fashion. From time to time he looked down respectfully at his attire. He sat with a hand on each knee, like a man waiting in a barber's shop. The glances he devoted to other passengers were furtive and shy. The bride was not pretty, nor was she very young. She wore a dress of blue cashmere, with small reservations of velvet here and there, and with steel buttons abounding. She continually twisted her head to regard her puff sleeves, very stiff, straight, and high. They embarrassed her. It was quite apparent that she had cooked, and that she expected to cook, dutifully. The blushes caused by the careless scrutiny of some passengers as she had entered the car were strange to see upon this plain, underclass countenance, which was drawn in placid, almost emotionless lines. They were evidently very happy. "'Ever been in a parlor car before?' he asked, smiling with delight. "'No,' she answered. "'I never was. It's fine, ain't it?' "'Great. And then after a while we'll go forward to the diner and get a big layout. Finest meal in the world. Charge a dollar.' "'Oh, do they?' cried the bride. "'Charge a dollar? Why, that's too much. For us, ain't it, Jack?' "'Not this trip, anyhow,' he answered bravely. "'We're going to go the whole thing.' Later he explained to her about the trains. You see, it's a thousand miles from one end of Texas to the other, and this train runs right across it and never stops but four times. He had the pride of an owner. He pointed out to her the dazzling fittings of the coach, and in truth her eyes opened wider as she contemplated the sea-green figured velvet, the shining brass, silver, and glass, the wood that gleamed as darkly brilliant as the surface of a pool of oil. At one end, a bronze figure sturdily held a support for a separated chamber, and at convenient places on the ceiling were frescoes in olive and silver. To the minds of the pair, their surroundings reflected the glory of their marriage that morning in San Antonio. This was the environment of their new estate, and the man's face in particular beamed with an elation that made him appear ridiculous to the Negro porter. This individual at times surveyed them from afar with an amused and superior grin. On other occasions, he bullied them with skill in ways that did not make it exactly plain to them that they were being bullied. He subtly used all the manners of the most unconquerable kind of snobbery. He oppressed them, but of this oppression they had small knowledge, and they speedily forgot that infrequently a number of travelers covered them with stares of derisive enjoyment. Historically, there was supposed to be something infinitely humorous in their situation. We are due in yellow sky at 342, he said, looking tenderly into her eyes. Oh, are we? she said, as if she had not been aware of it. To evince surprise at her husband's statement was part of her wifely amiability. She took from a pocket a little silver watch, and as she held it before her and stared at it with a frown of attention, the new husband's face shone. I bought it in San Antonio from a friend of mine, he told her gleefully. It's seventeen minutes past twelve, she said, looking up at him with a kind of shy and clumsy coquetry. A passenger noting this play grew excessively sardonic and winked at himself in one of the numerous mirrors. At last they went to the dining car. Two rows of negro waiters in glowing white suits surveyed their entrance with interest and also the equanimity of men who had been forewarned. The pair fell to the lot of a waiter who happened to feel pleasure in steering them through their meal. 
He viewed them with the manner of a fatherly pilot, his countenance radiant with benevolence. The patronage, entwined with ordinary deference, was not plain to them. And yet, as they returned to their coach, they showed in their faces a sense of escape. To the left, miles down a long purple slope, was a little ribbon of mist where moved the keening Rio Grande. The train was approaching it at an angle, and the apex was yellow sky. Presently, it was apparent that, as the distance from yellow sky grew shorter, the husband became commensurately restless. His brick-red hands were more insistent in their prominence. Occasionally, he was even rather absent-minded and far away when the bride leaned forward and addressed him. As a matter of truth, Jack Potter was beginning to find the shadow of a deed weigh upon him like a leaden slab. He, the town marshal of Yellow Sky, a man known, liked, and feared in his corner, a prominent person, had gone to San Antonio to meet a girl he believed he loved, and there, after the usual prayers, had actually induced her to marry him, without consulting Yellow Sky for any part of the transaction. He was now bringing his bride before an innocent and unsuspecting community. Of course, people in Yellow Sky married as it pleased them, in accordance with a general custom, but such was Potter's thought of his duty to his friends, or of their idea of his duty, or of an unspoken form which does not control men in these matters, that he felt he was heinous. He had committed an extraordinary crime. Face to face with this girl in San Antonio, and spurred by his sharp impulse, he had gone headlong over all the social hedges. At San Antonio he was like a man hidden in the dark. A knife to sever any friendly duty, any form, was easy to his hand in that remote city. But the hour of yellow sky, the hour of daylight, was approaching. He knew full well that his marriage was an important thing to his town. It could only be exceeded by the burning of the new hotel. His friends could not forgive him. Frequently he had reflected on the advisability of telling them by telegraph, but a new cowardice had been upon him. He feared to do it, and now the train was hurrying him toward a scene of amazement, glee, and reproach. He glanced out of the window at the line of haze swinging slowly in towards the train. Yellow Sky had a kind of brass band which played painfully to the delight of the populace. He laughed without heart as he thought of it. If the citizens could dream of his prospective arrival with his bride, they would parade the band at the station and escort them amid cheers and laughing congratulations to his adobe home. He resolved that he would use all the devices of speed and planescraft in making the journey from station to his house. Once within that safe citadel, he could issue some sort of a vocal bulletin, and then not go among the citizens until they had time to wear off a little of their enthusiasm. The bride looked anxiously at him. What's worrying you, Jack? He laughed again. I'm not worrying, girl. I'm only thinking of yellow sky. She flushed in comprehension. A sense of mutual guilt invaded their minds and developed a finer tenderness. They looked at each other with eyes softly aglow, but Potter often laughed the same nervous laugh. The flesh upon the bride's face seemed quite permanent. The traitor to the feelings of yellow sky narrowly watched the speeding landscape. We're nearly there, he said. Presently, the porter came and announced the proximity of Potter's home. He held a brush in his hand and, with all his airy superiority gone, he brushed Potter's new clothes as the latter turned this way and that way. Potter fumbled out a coin and gave it to the porter, as he had seen others do. It was a heavy and muscle-bound business, as that of a man shoeing his first horse. The porter took their bag, and as the train began to slow, they moved forward to the hooded platform of the car. Presently, the two engines and their long string of coaches rushed into the station of yellow sky. They have to take water here, said Potter from a constricted throat and in mournful cadence, as one announcing death. Before the train stopped, 
His eye had swept the length of the platform, and he was glad and astonished to see there was none upon it but the station agent, who, with a slightly hurried and anxious air, was walking toward the water tanks. When the train had halted, the porter alighted first and placed in position a little temporary step. Come on, girl, said Potter hoarsely. As he helped her down, they each laughed on a false note. He took the bag from the Negro and bade his wife cling to his arm. As they slunk rapidly away, his hangdog glance perceived that they were unloading the two trunks, and also that the station agent far ahead near the baggage car had turned and was running toward him, making gestures. He laughed and groaned as he laughed when he noted the first effect of his marital bliss upon yellow sky. He gripped his wife's arm firmly to his side and they fled. Behind him, the porter stood chuckling fatuously. Part 2 The California Express on the Southern Railway was due at Yellow Sky in 21 minutes. There were six men at the bar of the Weary Gentleman's Saloon. One was a drummer who talked a great deal and rapidly. Three were Texans who did not care to talk at that time and two were Mexican sheepherders who did not talk as a general practice in the weary gentleman's saloon. The barkeeper's dog lay on the boardwalk that crossed in front of the door. His head was on his paws, and he glanced drowsily here and there with the constant vigilance of a dog that is kicked on occasion. Across the sandy street were some vivid green grass plots, so wonderful in appearance amid the sands that burned near them in the blazing sun that they caused a doubt in the mind. They exactly resembled the grass mats used to represent lawns on the stage. At the cooler end of the railway station, a man without a coat sat in a tilted chair and smoked his pipe. The fresh-cut bank of the Rio Grande circled near the town, and there could be seen beyond it a great plum-colored plain of mesquite. Save for the busy drummer and his companions in the saloon, Yellow Sky was dozing. The newcomer leaned gracefully upon the bar and recited many tales with the confidence of a bard who has come upon a new field. And at the moment the old man fell downstairs with the bureau in his arms, the old woman was climbing up with two scuttles of coal, and of course... The drummer's tale was interrupted by a young man who suddenly appeared in the open door. He cried, Scratchy Wilson's drunk and is turned loose with both hands. The two Mexicans at once set down their glasses and faded out of the rear entrance of the saloon. The drummer, innocent and jocular, answered, All right, old man. Suppose he has. Come in and have a drink anyhow. But the information had made such an obvious cleft in every skull in the room that the drummer was obliged to see its importance. All had become instantly solemn. Say, he said, mystified, what is this? His three companions made the introductory gesture of eloquent speech, but the young man at the door forestalled them. It means, my friend, he answered as he came into the saloon, that for the next two hours this town won't be a health resort. The barkeeper went to the door and locked and barred it. Reaching out of the window, he pulled in heavy wooden shutters and barred them. Immediately, a solemn chapel-like gloom was upon the place. The drummer was looking from one to another. But say, he cried, what is this anyhow? You don't mean there's going to be a gunfight? Don't know whether there'll be a fight or not, answered one man grimly. But there'll be some shooting, some good shooting. The young man who had warned them waved his hand. Oh, there'll be a fight fast enough if anyone wants it. Anybody can get a fight out there in the street. There's a fight just waiting. The drummer seemed to be swayed between the interest of a foreigner and a perception of personal danger. What did you say his name was? he asked. Scratchy Wilson, they answered in chorus. And will he kill anybody? What are you going to do? Does this happen often? Does he rampage around like this once a week or so? Can he break in that door? No, he can't break down that door, replied the barkeeper. He's tried three times, but when he comes, you'd better lay down on the floor, stranger. He's dead sure to shoot at it, and a bullet may come through. Thereafter, the drummer kept a strict eye upon the door. 
The time had not yet been called for him to hug the floor, but as a minor precaution, he sidled near to the wall. Will he kill anybody? he said again. The men laughed low and scornfully at the question. He's out to shoot, and he's out for trouble. Don't see any good in experimenting with him. But what do you do in a case like this? What do you do? A man responded, Why, he and Jack Potter, but... In chorus, the other men interrupted, Jack Potter's in San Antone. Well, who is he? What's he got to do with it? Oh, he's the town marshal. He goes out and fights Scratchy when he gets on one of these tears. Wow, said the drummer, mopping his brow. Nice job he's got. The voices had toned away to mere whisperings. The drummer wished to ask further questions which were born of an increasing anxiety and bewilderment. But when he attempted them, the men merely looked at him in irritation and motioned him to remain silent. A tense waiting hush was upon them. In the deep shadows of the room, their eyes shone as they listened for sounds from the street. One man made three gestures at the barkeeper, and the latter, moving like a ghost, handed him a glass and a bottle. The man poured a full glass of whiskey and set down the bottle noiselessly. He gulped the whiskey in a swallow and turned again toward the door in immovable silence. The drummer saw that the barkeeper, without a sound, had taken a Winchester from beneath the bar. Later, he saw this individual beckoning to him, so he tiptoed across the room. You'd better come with me, back of the bar. No thanks, said the drummer, perspiring. I'd rather be where I can make a break for the back door. Whereupon, the man of bottles made a kindly but peremptory gesture. The drummer obeyed it and finding himself seated on a box with his head below the level of the bar, balm was laid upon his soul at sight of various zinc and copper fittings that bore a resemblance to armor plate. The barkeeper took a seat comfortably on an adjacent box. You see, he whispered, this here Scratchy Wilson is a wonder with a gun, a perfect wonder, and when he goes on the war trail, we hunt our holes, naturally. He's about the last one of the old gang that used to hang out along the river here. He's a terror when he's drunk. When he's sober, he's all right. Kind of simple. Wouldn't hurt a fly. Nicest fellow in town. But when he's drunk, whew! There were periods of stillness. I wish Jack Potter was back from San Antone, said the barkeeper. He shot Wilson up once, in the leg and he would sail in and pull out the kinks in this thing. Presently they heard from a distance the sound of a shot, followed by three wild yowls. It instantly removed a bond from the men in the darkened saloon. There was a shuffling of feet. They looked at each other. Here he comes, they said. Part 3 A man in a maroon-colored flannel shirt which had been purchased for purposes of decoration and made principally by some Jewish women on the east side of New York, rounded a corner and walked into the middle of the main street of Yellow Sky. In either hand, the man held a long, heavy blue-black revolver. Often he yelled, and these cries rang through a semblance of a deserted village, shrilly flying over the roofs in a volume that seemed to have no relation to the ordinary vocal strength of a man. It was as if the surrounding stillness formed the arch of a tomb over him. These cries of ferocious challenge rang against walls of silence. And his boots had red tops with gilded imprints, of the kind beloved in winter by little sledding boys on the hillsides of New England. The man's face flamed in a rage begot of whiskey. His eyes, rolling and yet keen for ambush, hunted the still doorways and windows. He walked with the creeping movement of the midnight cat. As it occurred to him, he roared menacing information. The long revolvers in his hands were as easy as straws. They were moved with an electric swiftness. The little fingers of each hand played sometimes in a musician's way. Plain from the low collar of the shirt, the cords of his neck straightened and sank, straightened and sank as passion moved him. The only sounds were his terrible invitations. 
The calm adobes preserved their demeanor at the passing of this small thing in the middle of the street. There was no offer of fight, no offer of fight. The man called to the sky. There were no attractions. He bellowed and fumed and swayed his revolvers here and everywhere. The dog of the barkeeper of the weary gentleman's saloon had not appreciated the advance of events. He yet lay dozing in front of his master's door. At sight of the dog, the man paused and raised his revolver humorously. At sight of the man, the dog sprang up and walked diagonally away with a sullen head and growling. The man yelled and the dog broke into a gallop. As it was about to enter an alley, there was a loud noise, a whistling, and something spat the ground directly before it. The dog screamed and, wheeling in terror, galloped headlong in a new direction. Again there was a noise, a whistling, and sand was kicked viciously before it. Fear stricken, the dog turned and flurried like an animal in a pen. The man stood laughing, his weapons at his hips. Ultimately, the man was attracted by the closed door of the weary gentleman's saloon. He went to it, and hammering with a revolver, demanded drink. The door remaining imperturbable, he picked a bit of paper from the walk and nailed it to the framework with a knife. He then turned his back contemptuously upon this popular resort, and walking to the opposite side of the street, and spinning there on his heel quickly and lithely, fired at the bit of paper. He missed it by a half inch. He swore at himself and went away. Later he comfortably fusilladed the windows of his most intimate friend. The man was playing with this town. It was a toy for him. But still there was no offer of fight. The name of Jack Potter his ancient antagonist, entered his mind, and he concluded that it would be a glad thing if he should go to Potter's house and by bombardment induce him to come out and fight. He moved in the direction of his desire, chanting Apache scalp music. When he arrived at it, Potter's house presented the same still front as had the other adobes. Taking up a strategic position, the man howled a challenge but this house regarded him as might a great stone god. It gave no sign. After a decent wait, the man howled further challenges, mingling them with wonderful epithets. Presently there came the spectacle of a man churning himself into deepest rage over the immobility of a house. He fumed at it as the winter wind attacks a prairie cabin in the north. To the distance there should have gone the sound of a tumult like the fighting of two hundred Mexicans. As necessity bade him, he paused for breath or to reload his revolvers. Part 4 Potter and his bride walked sheepishly and with speed. Sometimes they laughed together, shamefacedly and low. Next corner, dear, he said finally. They put forth the efforts of a pair walking bowed against a strong wind. Potter was about to raise a finger to point the first appearance of the new home when, as they circled the corner, they came face to face with a man in a maroon-colored shirt who was feverishly pushing cartridges into a large revolver. Upon the instant, the man dropped his revolver to the ground and, like lightning, whipped another from its holster. The second weapon was aimed at the bridegroom's chest. There was silence. Potter's mouth seemed to be merely a grave for his tongue. He exhibited an instinct to at once loosen his arm from the woman's grip, and he dropped the bag to the sand. As for the bride, her face had gone as yellow as old cloth. She was a slave to hideous rites gazing at the apparitional snake. The two men faced each other at a distance of three paces. He of the revolver smiled with a new and quiet ferocity. Trying to sneak up on me, he said. Try to sneak up on me. His eyes grew more baleful. As Potter made a slight movement, the man thrust his revolver venomously forward. No, you don't do it, Jack Potter. Don't you move a finger toward a gun just yet. Don't you move an eyelash. 
The time has come for me to settle with you, and I'm going to do it my own way and loaf along with no interfering. So if you don't want a gun bent on you, just mind what I tell you. Potter looked at his enemy. I ain't got a gun on me, Scratchy, he said. Honest, I ain't. He was stiffening and steadying, but yet somehow at the back of his mind, a vision of the Pullman floated, the sea-green figured velvet, the shining brass, silver and glass, the wood that gleamed as darkly brilliant as the surface of a pool of oil, all the glory of the marriage, the environment of the new estate, You know, I fight when it comes to fighting, Scratchy Wilson, but I ain't got a gun on me. You'll have to do all the shooting yourself. His enemy's face went livid. He stepped forward and lashed his weapon to and fro before Potter's chest. Don't you tell me you ain't got no gun on you, you whelp. Don't tell me no lie like that. There ain't a man in Texas ever see you without no gun. Don't take me for no kid. His eyes blazed with light and his throat worked like a pump. I ain't taking you for no kid, answered Potter. His heels had not moved an inch backward. I'm taking you for a damn fool. I tell you I ain't got a gun and I ain't. If you're going to shoot me up, you better begin now. You'll never get a chance like this again. So much enforced reasoning had told on Wilson's rage. He was calmer. If you ain't got a gun, why ain't you got a gun? He sneered. Been to Sunday school? I ain't got a gun because I've just come from San Antone with my wife. I'm married, said Potter. And if I thought there was going to be any galoots like you prowling around when I brought my wife home... I'd a had a gun, and don't you forget it. Married, said Scratchy, not at all comprehending. Yes, married. I'm married, said Potter distinctly. Married, said Scratchy. Seemingly, for the first time, he saw the drooping, drowning woman at the other man's side. No, he said. He was like a creature allowed a glimpse of another world. He moved a pace backward, and his arm with the revolver dropped to his side. "'Is this the lady?' he asked. "'Yes, this is the lady,' answered Potter. There was another period of silence. "'Well,' said Wilson at last, slowly, "'I suppose it's all off now.' "'It's off if you say so, Scratchy. You know I didn't make the trouble.' Potter lifted his valise. "'Well, I allow it's off, Jack,' said Wilson. He was looking at the ground. "'Married!' He was not a student of chivalry. It was merely that in the presence of this foreign condition he was a simple child of the earlier plains. He picked up his starboard revolver, and placing both weapons in their holsters, he went away." His feet made funnel-shaped tracks in the heavy sand. Mm-hmm.